Hey guys, Nick here, and today we're going to take a look at 2D kinematics and projectile motion problems. Uh, now this will be sort of a continuation of 1D kinematics, but if you already understand 1D kinematics, no need to go back to the previous video. Um, this will be a shorter lesson, um, because we're going to learn a general strategy that lets you attack a lot of variations of problems. Um, however, there will be just a really endless amount of possible problems that you could be asked about this. So this video, like most of our other videos, will mostly be that you get pretty much all the basic to medium problems, and then when there do come challenge problems, you'll have to adjust a little bit. Um, but hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to tackle all of the standards of the subject. Um, a key idea that we're going to use in almost every problem, and it's sort of the focus of 2D kinematics versus 1D kinematics, is that horizontal and vertical motion happen and you can use equations to determine how far something moves horizontally, how uh, what something's horizontal speed is, you can do it completely independently of the vertical speeds and how far things are moving up and down. Um, so in other words, you can calculate them separately, you can sometimes people say that they are independent of one another. Um, and just an example of what this means, of course we'll go back to it in detail and do some calculations with it. An example would be if a ball rolls off a table and it rolls off of the table horizontally with speed 3 meters per second, after 2 seconds the ball has still traveled 6 meters horizontally even though yes the ball is starting to fall downwards because of gravity its horizontal motion is unaffected by gravity. And this is really hard to wrap your head around at first. You think that, you know, the trajectory as the trajectory curves due to gravity, it's having less horizontal speed, but it turns out that's just not the case. And if you watch slow-mo video of things, it really requires slow-mo to be able to tell. Um, you will see that this is indeed true. So just once again, horizontal speed and motion totally unaffected by gravity. And again, you might hear people say this as it's independent of gravity. And actually, you know what? We're going to use this so often, this goes in galaxy pen too. Okay. Now, our general attack strategy is going to be this. Actually, I should do this in yellow. Okay. Almost all 2D kinematics problems are going to involve some sort of critical event, some time when something happens. And let me give you an example of that because it's kind of a trivial statement right now. Oops. Come on. Um, one example that we're going to study here is we're going to launch a ball with speed 20 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees and we're gonna ask what height is it when it hits this wall over here at location 15 oops 15 meters okay so how high will it hit will the ball hit over here? Will it hit up here? Will it hit down here? Will it not even make it to the wall? Um, that's the question that we're going to use to learn this uh, general attack strategy so we have some ideas of what we're talking about. So in this case the critical moment of the 2D motion problem is when the ball has reached horizontal location 15. Right, because at that point, the instant the ball has reached 15 meters in the x direction, it says, wait, stop the clock, stop the clock. Where is it up and down right before it's about to hit this wall? So the critical moment in this example, once again, is 
when the ball is at x equals 15. And again, that's because we stop the clock the instant the ball gets to x equals 15, and we ask, where is it? It's, it's literally an inch from the wall. Where is it right now? And at that point, all we need to do is calculate the vertical position at time, however long it took to get there. And at that point, it'll instantly tell us how high the ball is. Right? So the first step in this process will be find how long it takes to get to the critical moment. And then step two will be, once you have that time, so in this case we were finding the time when its x position was 15, you find the other coordinate. So in this case we're hunting after what's the y position at time whatever we just found at that instant. So you're going to find the other coordinate at that time you just found. Okay, and we're going to do a couple different examples, but first let's attack the problem that we've been looking at so far. Now, I maybe should put a step zero in here, um, and it's going to be because very, very, very often we're going to need to decompose a diagonal speed into up and down arrows. also known as decomposing it into its components. So I'll say x and y. Now just a reminder of how you would do this. We have an arrow of length 20 and an angle of 30 degrees and we're asked what are the side lengths of this triangle that essentially recreate the total diagonal speed. Right, the diagonal speed is a combination of a left and right speed, that's this one. We don't know exactly what it is, but we'll be able to find it with trick. And it's the combination of that with some vertical speed added up together, and that gives you the diagonal speed. And all we need to do is find these side lengths. Now I did put out a whole other trig video, so if you're unsure of how you can do this, um, head back and hit the trig video. Um, I do this uh, example a couple times. But in short, what you're going to do, and again, this is using a little bit of shorthand from the video, is to find this side, you say, oh, I know the hypotenuse, and I'm asking about what is the side opposite the angle, okay? And I know that my calculator has a button that if I punch in sine of the angle, so sine of 30 degrees in this case, the calculator is going to spit out a number. Um, in this case, the number will turn out to be 0.5. And what that number tells me is how big this side is relative to this side. And in this case, it's going to tell you that this side on the vertical side right here, oop, I just hit my desk, um, that this side on the vertical side right here is one half the length of the hypotenuse. So it would be length 10. And in equation form, how your calculator tells you that is that sine of the angle is the size of the opposite leg, that's this one, over the length of the hypotenuse, which you know is 20. And now all it is is you multiply both sides by 20 to get that the opposite side is of length 10, and the units just carry over meters per second. So perfect, we've found the vertical part. And now all we need to do is find the horizontal part. Similarly, there's another button on your calculator, the cosine button, that'll tell you, if you punch it in, how big the side next to the angle is relative to the hypotenuse. In this case, your calculator is going to tell you um, that it's something in the neighborhood of 70%. Let me just pull it up on my calculator to get the exact number. Let's see cosine of 30 gives us 0.866, so it's actually closer to 87%. Um, so in this case, again, we're plugging in an angle of 30 degrees, 
and this evaluates on your calculator to be 0.866 and that will tell you how big this side is relative to this side so it told you calculator just said I got you man it's about 87 percent of 20 so all you have to do is multiply both sides by 20 and you get that this side length is 17.32 and again you just tack on the units meters per second so we've completed step zero now we've broken down our triangle and in the future I will go a little faster on this so in in practice this doesn't take nearly as long okay so step zero has been completed now we've sort of oops we've sort of made life easier for ourselves because now we know the horizontal motion speed and remember our whole goal like sort of the main step is find how long it takes to get over to the wall 15 meters away so if I have something flying this way at speed 17.32 meters per second and I ask you how long does it take to travel a distance of 15 meters then it's just going to be a simple distance is speed times time equation because this horizontal speed is the same throughout. So all we have to do is replace our distance here with 15 meters and our velocity with 17.3. We'll divide both sides by 17.3 and we'll get that the time that it takes to for the ball to get to the wall is 0.867 seconds okay so this is the end of step one right here we found the time it takes for the ball to get to that critical point where we're being asked to check its information what's its height at that point so we found the time that it takes now all we need to do is find its y position at time 0.867 because again this time is right before it hits the wall we're asked, hey, check what the height of the ball is right now, right before it's about to hit this wall. So all we got to do is find what is the Y position at time is 0.867. Now remember here, we know how fast the ball was thrown upwards, and we know how long it's hanging in the air from, and we, we also know it started from the ground. So with that, using our master equation, I called it, from 1D kinematics, um, for those of you that haven't, it's that the change in height is the initial speed in that direction, so the initial y speed, plus one half the y acceleration times the time that it's moving for squared. Okay, so all that we have to do is plug this time into this equation, plug in whatever our known y speed, y acceleration due to gravity are, and that'll tell us what y has changed to at time 0.867. So if we actually plug in numbers here, our initial y speed was upwards 10. We plug in t equals 0.867. Okay, acceleration y. Now I did cover this in the last video, but just again, we're calling things that go up positive and things that go down negative, right? That's why our y speed is positive 10 because it's going up. And gravity's acceleration is always down. So gravity's acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And then we multiply by time 0.867 again, but this time it's squared. And if you plug this in your calculator, you get that it equals 4.99 meters. And again, this is the y coordinate, aka the height, at time 0.867. And this time, where the ball re has reached the wall. Where it has just reached the wall. 
Excellent. So again, just a quick recap. We decomposed this diagonal arrow into a purely horizontal component and a purely vertical component. And we know that once we have that broken up, according to our thing in Galaxy Pen here, that they work really quite separately of each other. So to find how long it took to get over to the wall in the left to right sense, all we had to do was do this simple problem of a ball moves to the right at 17 meters per second, how long does it take it to get 15 meters? We didn't have to worry about the fact that the ball was going up and down. Once we had that time that it took, all we had to do was plug in to the equation that tells us what height is at each time, which is this master equation right here, right? This outputs what the y coordinate is at each time. And at that point we had our answer. Uh, now one comment or one comment I want to make is I did use this form oops of the master equation with delta y. Some people write it as y equals y initial plus this other stuff. And for us, y initial was zero, because the ball started on the ground. Um, but alternatively, you could write it as the change in y from your initial position is whatever. And then we found the change in y was 4.99 meters from the starting point of zero. So obviously, the actual end height is 4.99. But if you started on, let's say, a 2 meter tall stool, your answer instead would be 6.99 meters. Okay, let's do another example, and I'll go uh, just a tad bit faster. Um, and this will really be quite similar. Okay. Example two will be a ball rolls off a table. Oops. With height three meters at speed two meters per second, how far does the ball land from the table? Okay, so here's our table, or our cliff. The ball's moving with speed three meters per second, and this height right here is three meters. And we're asking how far away will it land from the table's edge. Okay, um, step zero would be to decompose any diagonal speeds, but there aren't here, so step zero is for free. Okay, step one, identify what direction slash what is the critical event, critical time. When the ball's, lo when what has happened with the ball's location, are we asked to stop the clock? So for us, it's the, when the ball hits the ground, when the ball lands. So, and we're asked to stop the clock as soon as the ball lands and check what's its X position right now. So question one, or uh, step one would be to find T that it takes for the ball to hit the ground. So basically find how long it takes an object to fall three meters. Okay, for this, we're able to use, as pretty much always, you're able to use our master equation, that the change in y is equal to the initial y speed times the time for which something falls, plus that. Um, your professors might show you a shortcut equation to find this. It really is just this equation after you've crossed out this term, like we're about to in a second. So. Uh, don't don't be confused if your professor is showing you a different way. All right, now our initial y speed is zero because all this initial speed is horizontal. There's no vertical component to the motion, so this term gets crossed out. Okay, the acceleration due to gravity, as usual, if we call things that go up positive and things that go down negative, since a of gravity points down, it's negative 9.8. Okay, and delta y is going to be negative 3. Why is it negative? Well, remember, it's y final minus y initial over here. y final is 0, and y initial is 3. So the change in y is negative 3. 
Okay, if we move stuff around, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2, cancel out the negative, and then divide by 9.8. Okay, and I can take the square root of both sides. Okay. Now if I punch this in on my calculator, where is my square root key? There we are. We get that t equals 0.782 seconds. Perfect. So that is the critical time. And all we now need to know is what is the other coordinate, so what is its x position after 0.782 seconds. Check it. Freeze the clock right the instant before the ball hits the ground, and how far left and right has it moved. Now, this part of the problem, the step two, is pretty simple once we have the time, right? Because it's just boiled down to an object we're only asking about its uh, left and right motion, and we're only concerned about how far over the course of 0.782 seconds does a ball moving two meters per second to the right move, right? It's just another simple distance is speed times time. So in this case, the speed is two meters per second. Again, because even though it's falling, it keeps whatever horizontal speed it has had as it is falling. And we multiply it by the time, 0.782 seconds. And we get that the distance traveled is 1.56 meters. Excellent. OK, let's do an example with projectiles. And I'm going to show you the full way, and I'm going to show you a cheaty way. There's a secret equation you can use in a very certain scenario. Now, those are always a little dangerous because it's tempting to use it when you're not allowed to. But I'll later show you a cheaty way that you can solve the problem really fast. So let's say I again have a ball. Let's say the speed is 30 meters per second, and the angle that it's fired at is 60 degrees. So let me redraw the triangle to be a little more reflective. And I'm asked, what is the range that the cannonball lands at? So it's going to take this nice big arc. Bang. OK, so step zero will be to decompose this diagonal arrow into a rightwards arrow plus an upwards arrow and to find how big they are. Now again, to find this side, you're going to use the sine function on your calculator, which tells you how big the side opposite the angle is relative to the diagonal. So again, sine of 60 will tell you opposite over hypotenuse, and you know the hypotenuse is 30. So the opposite is going to be 30 times sine of 60 always making sure you're in degrees. So 25.98, we'll call it 26 meters per second is the vertical part. And then similarly to find this side, we're going to use the cosine table on our calculator, which looks up, says, hey calculator, next the side next to a 60 degree angle in a right triangle, how what fraction of the hypotenuse is it? And cosine of 60 will spit out I think it actually spits out exactly one half. Oops. And it do indeed it does. So the adjacent is then of side or of size fifteen meters per second. Perfect. So step zero is complete. We've reduced that complicated diagonal motion down into a left-right component and an up-down component. OK, step one is to find this critical event, this critical thing that happens when we're asked to stop the clock. Now, we're asked about the range of a projectile when it hits the ground again. So whenever its height is 0, 
is that critical trigger where the guy says, stop the clock, stop the clock, freeze frame. What X position are you at right now? We need to find what time he's asking about. So we need to find when, or find time when the height will equal zero again, obviously besides its initial height. Now there's a couple ways to do this. Um, I'm going to show you the way that most people would instinctively do, then I'll show you another way that is a little easier but it can be a little trickier to remember. So the first way would be to write that the change in y is vit plus one half, and again this is the y speed only. Okay. Um, now, if we we want when delta y is zero, okay, we plug in all the other variables that we know, and we try to find t if it is the only leftover variable. So initial y speed, that's this vertical part, again treated totally independently of the fact that there's also horizontal stuff going on. So this is 26 times t. Okay, uh, a y is negative 9.8, so overall this is negative 4.9 after you do the division by 2. Okay, and at this point you can quote unquote divide both sides by t, or more strictly you could factor it Um, but to most people, dividing both sides by t is more apparent. Either way, whether you choose to factor or not, the result is that you get 26 minus 4.9 t equals 0. Okay, all you got to do is move this to the other side and then divide both sides by 4.9. And you get that this critical time when the ball hits the ground again, is 5.3 seconds. Perfect. Now all we need to do is find how far something moving 15 meters per second to the right moves to the right in 5 seconds. So for part 2 all we gotta do is our usual distances speed times time. Again this 15 is completely separate of the fact that there is Y motion going on. All we care about is what's its horizontal location at time 5 seconds. So all we do is we multiply the 5 seconds it's flying for times its 15 meters each second it's in the air. Okay, and the result, if you multiply 15 by 5.3, is that d equals 79.5 meters. So that is the range of the cannonball. Um, by the way, I promised I would give you a way that some other people find this critical time. Um, some people do it by sort of the symmetry of this parabola, and they ask how long does it take the ball to get to the top, which you don't express that as how long does it take to get to this height. You express the critical event as when the ball's vertical speed is zero. So. An alternative way, and again this is not the most important so you don't need to use it, but it can be useful to know, is that an alternative way is find when the vertical speed of the ball is zero, and that's not this point, that's this point, and then all you do is you multiply that time by two. So to how you would find this is you use the fact that the change in velocity is acceleration times time. You have an initial upward speed of 10 and a final speed of 0. So your delta V is, or sorry, not 10, 26. You have an initial upward speed of 26. And by the end, at, the, at this point, your vertical speed is down to 0. So you have a delta V of negative 26. Your acceleration is negative 9.8. This will give you t equals 2.65 seconds. And then all you have to do is multiply it by 2 to get the ground.
time. Okay. Actually, we're going to do another example with this later, I realized, um, because this does pop up pretty frequently on tests. When does a ball hit its apex? What is the highest point something rises to? Um, so we will do a quick example with this. You'll, as you see, it isn't that difficult, but there are multiple ways, and it's not always clear which one to use. Okay. Um, just as a side note here, Actually, no, let's let's do this as a full problem. We're going to extend this example because this is very frequently asked about. What is ball's velocity? So that means size and angle as it hits the ground. And we're actually not going to do this for this nice example. What we're going to do is we're going to do this example right here because it's much less symmetric. It's much less obvious. For this cannonball example, when it comes back down, it turns out that its vertical speed will just be downwards 26 meters per second, sort of by the symmetry of the path it takes. Um, but for this one, it's not really clear what to do. So we're going to extend this example to find its speed right before it hits the ground. Yes, its horizontal speed is still 2, but we need to find its vertical speed, and we're going to need to do Pythagorean Theorem to find its total speed. So again, just as a refresher, we have this situation. Ball rolling off a 3 meter table at 2 meters per second. We found that it takes 0.782 seconds before it hits the ground splat. So the splat happens at 0.782 seconds. Okay, and again we're asked what is its speed, its total speed look like at this time. So its horizontal speed is still going to be 2 meters per second. The question is what's its vertical speed? Now, thankfully, we've already calculated what this critical time is when it goes splat, and we're asked to check what is its speed at this instant. So all we need to do is find the vertical speed after um, 0.782 seconds of falling. So the question is really reduced to, you drop a ball, it falls for 0.78 seconds, what's its speed after? And the simple equation that you can use is that um, oops, that the change in velocity is acceleration times time, and you know the acceleration, it's negative 9.8, you know the time, it's 0 0.782 seconds, so the total speed, or sorry, not the total speed, the downward speed that it has, right, this is only for its y speed, we do the y speeds separately from the x speeds, is negative 7.66 meters per second. And again, this negative sign, all it's saying is that the ball started with zero speed, and now its speed is pointing very far downwards, right? So you can alternatively write this as 7.66 meters per second down. So. At this point, we've done all the actual physics. All we need to do is convert this triangle into its hypotenuse plus, I guess you would say this angle, the angle below horizontal that it hits with, but your professor might ask for, I don't know, this angle, in which case you do almost the same thing. Okay, so first task will be find the size of this hypotenuse, which is going to be a Pythagorean theorem job. It's tempting to always try and use trig, and it does work. Trig will 100% work if you want to use, um, I don't know, you can find this angle using arctangent and then use cosine or sine, but the Pythagorean theorem is always a safe bet to find the hypotenuse. So, you know that the hypotenuse squared is the sum of the other side squared. So the hypotenuse's length is the square root of 2 squared plus 7.66 squared.
and if you punch that into your calculator, you get that it is 7.92 meters per second of total speed. Again, it has kept its 2 meters per second right, and it, over the course of falling, picks up some downward speed. Okay, and now all there is left to do is to find this angle. Now you know from trig that if you know these two sides of a right triangle, that you've got that angle. And the way you do this, again, this is covered in the uh, trig video, is, oops, not 10, negative one. You say, hey, I have the opposite and adjacent sides here. I sure wish I could use this formula to do something about that. So instead of adjacent, we have two, and instead of the opposite angle, we write in our value of 7.66. And all you have to do is you take the arc tangent of both sides. Again, this is different than cotangent, and it's different than 1 divided by tangent. It's a new button on your calculator. Okay, And this tells us theta is arctan of this. And if you punch this in in your calculator, you get that theta is 75. 0.4 degrees. So these two together comprise your answer. The speed is about 8 meters per second, and it's directed in this way, like 75 degrees below horizontal. Excellent. Okay, I now realize that I broke my promise of teaching you the cheaty way for the projectile motion problem. And I may choose to cut this in the actual video and put it next to the example. Um, so there is a cheaty formula for projectile motion. Um, th that is this. I should actually say it's the cheaty formula for projectile range. So this for, so for projectile oops for projectiles ranges. Now, first a word of caution. This only works for ground launch so it can't be launched off of height and flat ground so the final impact height must also be zero or at least it has to be the same it has to be the same height so it works for this very specific case of you launch a ball here with some speed and some angle how far does it go if there's a hill here um, it doesn't work if you're asked what is uh, its speed at impact this formula doesn't tell you anything if you are asked how high does it go this formula still doesn't tell you anything so this is good for a very restricted thing but it comes up a lot Okay, and the formula is that range is the velocity squared times sine of, and then in parentheses, it's two times the launch angle divided by 9.8. Okay, and this is the total launch speed. No need to decompose it into um, left and right up and down. So I'll say no need to trig decompose. So as an example for this problem up here, v is 30, theta is 60, and your problem is done. Range would be 30 that's our speed squared, sine of, not sine of 60, but sine of 120. Oops. Okay, I can't close the parentheses because the scroll bar is going to get me. And then you divide by g, which is 9.8. Uh, by the way, just to comment, guys, whenever you see g in a formula, usually it means the size of gravity's acceleration. And when you're writing in the acceleration into equations, that is the size. It's of size g pointed down, so negative 9.8. So usually g represents the number positive 9.8, but it's pointed down when you punch it into equations 
involving accelerations. Um, don't worry about it too much. It, it isn't really ambiguous. Obviously, range won't be negative of this number. Um, and if, if you punch this in, you'll get the same result as before. Okay, let's see. All right, we will tackle one more example, and it'll be this apex problem. A basketball is shot from five meters above the ground. Okay, actually, I shouldn't say five meters. That's 15 feet, and no one's that tall. All right, we'll say two meters. We'll make, we'll make it shack shooting here. From two meters above the ground with speed. By the way, this absolute value of V means the size of the velocity arrow, which is the speed. Um, with speed three meters per second at launch angle 50 degrees. And we're going to answer a couple questions. A will be, what is the time until it hits its apex, so highest point? Part B will be, what is its velocity at the highest point? And then for a challenge example, we're going to say the hoop is at height 2.2 meters. Uh, this is not the actual height of a basketball hoop. It's a little bigger. I think it's probably near 3.5 meters. Um, hoop is at height 2.2 meters. How far away should the player stand to make the shot? Okay. So let's start with parts A and B. Again, those are the more standard ones. Part C is definitely a challenge question. It's probably one of the hard questions on your homeworks. So we'll tackle that last just to get some practice with how you might extend these ideas. But it'll all be the same process. So for part A, time until the highest point. So here we have our man Shaq. The ball starts two meters above the ground, and it takes a shot 2.2 meters per, oops, sorry, uh, three meters per second at an angle of 50 degrees. Oh, sorry, three meters per second of speed at angle 50 degrees. Okay, first question is how long until it hits the highest point? So first step, as always, is step zero. We want to decompose this triangle into its left piece and its right piece. So by now we're getting a little faster at this. We say, hey, the sine formula is going to tell us this. Sine 50 will tell us what the opposite side that we're hunting for is divided by the hypotenuse, which is 3. So the opposite side is length 3 times sine of 50, which is 2.3 meters per second. So this side is 2.3 meters per second. And to get this side, we know that, hey, the cosine formula usually tells us what that is. The cosine button will tell us what the adjacent side, which we're hunting for, is divided by hypotenuse. So we multiply 3 times cosine of 50 to get the adjacent side. And this is 1.93 meters per second. Okay, perfect. Step zero is done. All right. The time until the highest point. So the thing that's special about the highest point, like the trigger that says, hey, you've reached the highest point. Check, check it out at this time. What's going on? The trigger is that the vertical speed of the ball 
has become zero instead of its original speed of upwards 2.3. So to find how long it takes that speed to get killed off, once again we use our equation that the change in speed in the y direction is the acceleration times the time. Now we know that the change in speed is going to be negative 2.3 right because it starts with positive 2.3 and then all that positive 2.3 gets killed off by the end it subtracts out so the total speed change is negative 2.3 and that equals gravity acceleration is negative 9.8 as usual times the time for which that acceleration is happening and at this time the total speed change will have added up to two, negative 2.3 meaning that whatever time we find, that's the time where the y speed will get totally killed off to zero. So all there is to do is divide out, get t equals 2.2, three, oops, two, three, five seconds. So that's all it takes for it to reach its apex. Okay. Um, I should also add, what is the height at highest point onto this question. Okay, so perfect. We already have this time. All we need to do is ask what is its y position at this time value? Well, using the master equation, we know that y at whatever time is just the initial y plus the y speed times time plus this, right? This is just the master equation, but instead of, oops, that's the same thing, by the way, that I just erased. Instead of writing this as delta y equals this stuff, I broke it up into the other standard way you see it. Final position is initial position plus the change in position. Um, exact same equation. All right, and if everything we've done is correct so far, we actually should instantly be able to solve this just by substituting in numbers. So let's see. Uh, we're hunting after y final. We want to know what the y final is at this instant t equals 0.235. So we leave that as a variable. Initial y is whatever Shaq uh, shot it from. Its initial speed or in its initial height, which is two. Its y speed is 2.3 meters per second. We're asking what is y final, not at any time, but at t equals 0.235. Acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.8. And again, we're asking about it at time equals 0.235. So you plug this monster into your calculator. And you get that the y final at this time, t equals 0.235, is 2.27 meters above the ground. Awesome. By the way, I'm just going to make this height a little smaller. Okay. Part B. What's its velocity slash speed? Or sorry, what's its velocity at its highest point? Um, for this one, it's helpful to just look back at our picture here. Once the ball reaches its highest arc, or the highest point in its arc, it still has its horizontal motion, so it still keeps this 1.93 meters per second. And does it have any vertical speed that instant at its, at its highest point? No. Right? It's, it's just at that point where its vertical speed used to be 0.1 meters per second up, for now it's zero, and in a second it's going to be 0.1 meters per second down. But at this instant, there's no speed. So the whole answer is that for part B, it's just 1.93 meters per second to the right. And that's just from drawing the picture. Now again, just a reminder, it's not three meters per second right because the vertical part here it got gradually killed off as time went on but this horizontal speed that we found using trig it did stick around 
Okay, at this point, we'll start the challenge example, um, and after that, it'll wrap up the video. Um, as usual with challenge examples, don't be discouraged if you don't get them immediately. The absolute most important things by far in the rest of this video are parts A and B, and the methodology behind them. But let's take a look at part C for some possible extensions that you might see. Okay, so I said that the hoop is 2.1 meters in height. By the way, guys, diagrams really indispensable here. That was a pretty good basketball hoop, actually. Okay, this height right here is 2.1 meters. This height where it started is two, oops, just two meters from Shaq. And we're asking how far will this distance, how far should this distance be so that just barely the ball is located height 2.1 at, well, however far this is. Okay, so uh, we've already broken down the initial speeds. Let me just copy down that triangle. So we had three, 1.93 going to the left, three on the diagonal, which we won't really need, and then 2.3 meters per second going upwards. Okay, so here's a pretty complete diagram of the situation. Okay, now we have already broken up things, so step zero is done. All right, step one. What is the critical like trigger that tells us, hey, check, check, is the ball right over the basket? And the check is gonna be, when is the ball's height? Two point one. And this is the hardest part of the problem being able to rephrase this question of how far away should the basket be into identifying this thing in the problem that you're actually going to be able to find, which is what time does the ball pass by the hoop's height? Does it, so at this instant, time equals whatever we're about to find. Is the ball's X location here or is it here? Those would be misses. Alternatively, if you check at that time when the ball's height is 2.1 and its location is on top of the hoop, you've made your shot. Okay, so that is the confusing part about this problem. Recasting this distance question into this critical time that you need to find. So once we have this identified, we're gonna have relatively smooth sailing for the rest of this problem. Okay, again, if you don't get this, maybe rewatch it, think about it for a little bit. It isn't the most obvious thing I know. Okay, so all we're after is, at what time does the height equal 2.1? So, as usual, we just check if our master equation tells us anything, because almost always it's the answer. Okay, um, let's check if, do we know every variable in this equation except for time? Well, we know y final because it's 2.1. That's going to be the y at the time we're asking about. We know y initial. We know its initial y speed. It's 2.3, right? This. We don't know time, so that's okay. As long as there's only one variable in this equation, we're safe, and we can guaranteed find it. Okay, acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.8 as usual. He's great. All right, awesome. So we actually have one equation, one unknown. So we are guaranteed to be able to know what T solves this. It might take the quadratic formula, which yes is annoying, but we're guaranteed to get the answer. Okay, perfect. So all it is is, okay, unfortunately, we do have the quadratic formula here because we have T squared and T, and we can't like divide through by T. So we're gonna have to do some quadratic formula grinding. Now at this point, once you've checked this, you should just breathe a sigh of relief, say, I know the quadratic formula is coming, I know it's ugly, but 
you know, it's a couple steps and I'll get t equals two seconds or whatever. And at that point, all the ugliness doesn't matter. All I'm doing is this ugliness to find something to complete your goal. Okay. So I'm, all I'm going to do for the next couple lines is move terms over so I get the nice positive sign. So I'll move this over, move this over, move this over. So 4.9t squared minus 2.3t plus 0.1 equals 0. Okay, again, all I was doing is moving terms over because we're going to need a quadratic formula. Okay, now I use quadratic formula to find t. Now, note, you'll get two t values. And what, remember, all this is telling us is at what time is the height 2.1. So one time will be here, and the other time will be here when it passes the hoop's height on its way up, which obviously you don't make the shot if you shoot it from underneath the hoop. So we will, at the end, we'll toss out this number because we know we want this number from the physical picture. Okay, so the t that solves it will be negative b plus minus square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. Okay, uh, let's work on this in pieces. Square root of that Okay, again, we have two numbers for t here, and we want the bigger one because that's the time when it's coming back down on its way to the hoop. So we'll not care about the negative sign. So t equals 0.421 seconds. Tragic, only 0 0.001 off of a nice number. Okay, so at this point, we've found this critical information time, and all we need to do is convert that using, like, d equals vt into a distance. So, let's see. What distance should we have so that the ball, which is moving at horizontal speed 1.93 meters per second, cover it in... Uh, 0.4 seconds. Okay, again, this is just a simple d equals vt. So we know the time that we're asking about, 0.421 seconds. We know the velocity of the ball, 1.93. And this is how far the ball will move in 0.421 seconds. So distance will be 0.813 meters. And that's the final answer to the challenge problem. Now again, what we were doing here is we were asking if we stand just the right amount away after 0.421 seconds, which regardless of how far I stand is where the ball will come down, if I stand just right after 0.421 seconds, this ball, which moves this fast for those 0.421 seconds, will go perfectly on top of the hoop because we place the hoop 0.813 meters away. Right In 0.421 seconds, the ball will move 1.93 times 0.421 seconds over. So you stand that far away, and voila, the ball will perfectly go down the middle of the hoop. All right, guys, excellent work today. Uh, that's 2D kinematics, mostly done. Again, there are a lot of other possible problem types. Don't get too flustered. There will be this difficult art of converting these seemingly weird questions into, oh, find the time that we're asked about the snapshot of. But um, don't get too phased by that, really. 
Um, yeah, uh, just one final comment will be um, be careful using the range formula. People love to use it for everything, but I promise you it is much more dangerous than it is helpful because you can only do it on flat ground. So be careful with it. Stick in general to this zero, one, two step process and best of luck to you. And I'll see you in the next video where we'll start forces, which is the most difficult yet the most rewarding thing in physics once you get it right. I'll see you there.